floor is yours. Thank you, Rick. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. So we can, yep. Great. Okay. Um, Excellent. Uh, Thanks. Oscar, Oscar talked about, um, you know, why butterflies look like they do and, uh, and, and, and something about their biology and uh, ethology. And Farney gave us a challenge is to go and find, uh, find some of the missing species. What I'm going to talk about and show you some pictures of is, is where to go and look for them. Something about the, um, you know, if you're actually going to go butterflying and, and you, want, you want to find some of these creatures, the sort of places you can look. And this is not just in South Africa. It's anywhere, in fact, not just Africa, it's in the world. They tend to like similar places. So let me just move in here. Some things to remember, a little bit like you do with birds. The butterflies are largely territorial. If you find the territory, you find the butterfly. Some are migratory. Some of them are homebodies. Most of them need food to survive as adults. As Oscar said, some of them don't feed as adults. Vector isn't the only food source. Uh, they, they also need low, uh, larval host plants or host food often very specialized, and of course not all the larvae are herbivores. So a few other things they need to drink, um, not always, some of them can't, but most of them do. Um, being mostly herbivores, a little bit like, like deer and antelope, which need uh, salt licks in order to, uh, to survive. Same with butterflies and moths, is that the males in particular need to take in salt in order to um, uh, generate their, their gametes, their, their sex cells. So you often find them attracted to places where there's a lot of salts. They use scent as often as visual cues to recognize potential mates. Many of them are distasteful predators or look like they are, as Oscar showed earlier. And there are as many diurnal moth species as there are butterflies. There are a lot of things that look like butterflies but are not. So let's move into some behavioral um, parts of butterflies. First of all, territorial behavior. A lot of these places are in South Africa, but Wherever you are in Africa, you'll find a similar sort of habitats where you find them. First of all, the top there, you've got these, you've got these clearings. Um, now, forest clearings are great because the butterflies tend to sit on, on prominent bushes and trees around the edges of the clearings. And it sometimes helps with a pair of binoculars because sometimes they sit high, but not always. And you just go and spend a bit of time there, just watch and wait. Uh, when you first walk in there, they might fly away, but they'll come back. Um, you can see there's a couple of examples here. Um, this one here is a forest clearing uh, at a place called Ndomi Park, where you've got a clearing on top of a hill, which is like a double whammy. Uh, butterflies love hilltops, particularly males. And there's a lot of examples of, of hilltopping here. And prominent, prominent bushes as well. They like to sit on a, on a bush like this, which is on top of a ridge, and it stands out. Uh, this particular uh, Corexes castor here, a giant Corexes, He's sitting in Impelosi Nature Reserve on a prominent acacia bush on top of a, on top of a, um, a hill in the reserve. You can see here there's several examples of, of butterflies sitting on, the, on, on very exposed places. Even a tall grass stem can be used as a perch by these butterflies. And there's a couple of examples there. Uh, any, anybody who lives locally will laugh when they see that one because that's one hilltop you can't get to unless you're a rock climber because there's a, there's a 50 meter deep, deep gap here that's about five meters wide. Um, but near there, you get a lot of good butterflies. That photograph was taken there. Okay, also on behavior. Um, we were talking earlier on about, you know, how butterflies uh, need salts, particularly the males, in, in order to, um, uh, to develop their gametes. Uh, mud puddling is the, uh, is the word for it, and, and it happens everywhere. Here's some examples. You've got the uh, uh, citrus swallowtail, the Cleodemodocus, some sword tails there, some green banded swallowtails, uh, grass yellows, the, the brown veined white, Villanosa rota, with one uh, sword tail there, a white lady, uh, one, of the little, one of the little Lycenids, and Dixia pigia. And uh, the interesting thing at the bottom here, this skipper, Spiralia delagoa, you can see, there's its tongue and it's sucking something here. I didn't manage to get it, get it on, on film, but it's actually it was floating urine or what passes for urine amongst, um, among, amongst butterflies onto, the, onto this sand and sucking it up. So what it was doing is it's actually using its body fluids and reusing them. And as it does so, it's concentrating the salts in its bodies. There's a very easy way as an epidopterist that you can actually trigger this behavior. And Torben Larson knew it well. Torben used to fill whiskey bottles full of his own urine and uh, take it up into the forests and uh, sprinkle this 
around the mud near some of the streams, which obviously attracted a lot of butterflies, which he then was able to photograph and, uh, and, and, and catch. Um, the, the joke is, of course, he left some of them um, locked in his car in the car park at the forest and he came back to find the car had been broken into and the bottles had gone. And that's, he tells that in his, in his book, of Hazards of Butterfly Collecting. And I've done it myself. You, you just sprinkle a bit of urine on the mud, wait a while, and in they come. Also on the behavioral side, um, we're talking about butterflies that are distasteful, the Amoris genus is here is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a novice, Amoris ochlea. Now, uh, it used to be thought that these butterflies uh, absorb poisons from their host plants as larvae. Uh, and the larvae do, they, they feed on, uh, on the upper cyanaceae, which, which contain cardiac glycosides. But it was noticed that a lot of these plants are not poisonous. In fact, people eat them as, as vegetables. And, but you still find monarch, or sorry, plain tiger, or, uh, or, or, or these other species of Danaini feeding on the plants, uh, but the adults would still be toxic. And uh, a guy called, uh, called uh, Michael Bopre in Germany, he found out that in actual fact, the habit that we've known about for years of these butterflies, they go to wounded plants. This one here is on a Senecio, but they also use things like Heliotropium. And they actually suck the alkaloids that the plant develops. When the plant's wounded, it gives these bitter chemicals off to de deter herbivores. And the butterfly comes along and sucks up these, uh, these alkaloids and produces its own, um, its own toxins. And also the males produce a pheromone which attracts the females. And when he mates with the female, the female never does this. When he mates with the female, he passes a package of alkaloid across to her. So it's like a combination of, of, uh, of wedding presents and, uh, and aftershave. Um, here's some of the common behavioral traits. The, the, the nymphalids often bask in the sun with their wings wide open. And the, the wings actually use as solar heaters to heat the body up, particularly early in the morning when it's cold. You'll see them basking like this. Yellow butterflies love to sit amongst yellowed leaves. If you see in the bush a tree that's got yellowed leaves uh, adhering to it, it's a good idea to go and give that bush a poke because you never know what's going to fly out. It's a aphrodrias leader, very well camouflaged. And they, they seem to know, they've got colour vision. They, they actually seek these yellowed leaves out and, and hide in them. Mating is something that we see a lot of. This is a pair of skippers. It's a buff tip skipper, not sure line cannabis. Butterflies mate tail to tail like this. And they're very often very easy to photograph because they're preoccupied. They don't want to fly away. Um, skulking is another thing that they do. This is a butterfly that's found virtually all over um, sort of tropical forests in Africa. Uh, the, the yellow banded evening brown, the Nopalese bit Sabina. This is a forest down on our coast here. And this butterfly is always found in shady areas. And you can see it's very well camouflaged. A lot of butterflies like to sit on the forest floor and are very difficult to spot. A lot of our, our, um, our butterfly species like this, this Gordy Commodore, uh, Pressis uh, Octavia, particularly at cold times of the year. This was photographed a few weeks ago down here in Natal in the middle of winter. And this particular shadowy area here, there are about, oops, hang on, clicked the wrong button. Um, there we go. We're filled with about 20 or 30 of these Gordy Commodores are all um, estivating or hibernating, sorry, in these, uh, in these areas here. Yeah, I managed to photograph this one with flash. Here's some more sexual behavior. This is a pair of graphians. Uh, they get their Latin name from the, uh, from pencil, from, from graphia. And you can see the male here, he's busy fluttering his wings and this, this yellowish patch you can see is actually his scent scales. And he's, he's fluttering and he's, he's scattering pheromones all over the female. And this female here, you can see she's getting very excited and they're ready to mate. So that's just some examples of a sort of behavior. It's like birds, the behavior is half of the fun, more than half of the fun is actually watching them interacting with one another. And living, and living their lives. Nectaring, of course, feeding, very important. Um, we all know that butterflies tend to like flowers, so which flowers to look up? Well, first of all, your, your papilios, your, 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 your bigger butterflies tend to, tend to feed on, on, on larger flowers. Uh, I'm bragging a bit here, this one's Papilio euphronor, it's our, it's our only endemic papilio down here in South Africa. It's got a similar species up in West Africa, like Papilio horribilis. The caterpillars always, always feed on, uh, on laurel rather than feeding on citrus. And this is on Carpernia, which is a beautiful forest tree with big yellow P-type flowers. But then again, we get smaller flowers. We've got this Judoris Diocles on Tetraselega natalensis, which is a, a beautiful um, 
um, multi-flowered multi, uh, plant. I'll show you some more photographs later. Uh, Dimbolia oblongifolia, which is, um, Dimbolias are found a lot over Africa. You can see uh, a lot of denades flying around it. Um, Dicliptera, which is in the, um, it's one of the, oh, I forget exactly what the family of plants is called now. Um, and uh, here on this uh, poly, uh, Parapolydora, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is a, one, of, one of the um, Benonia type plants, when these fly in the drier areas, you often get thousands and thousands of, of butterflies on them. Uh, another one of that group is this Benonia colorata and Osteospermum. You see they've got these ray florets and they've got these short florets in the middle and you know, the nectar's close to the surface. Red flowers, also very popular. This particular one, Clymia fulgens, a red senecio, very common all over Southern Africa with the Cacatelia florella feeding on it. And then of course, they don't only feed on natural plants, they feed on these horrendous invaders like Lantana camara. And this, this uh, Bilanose creona is feeding on Lantana camara. Lantana camara is actually a Central American plant that's spread virtually all over the world. A couple of examples of, 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 of non-flower nectar. This woolly legs, Nacrophema bibulus, is actually feeding on a cushion scale insect, which is also being milked by ants. You see the ants here as well. And this is one of those butterflies whose caterpillars live in ants' nests, and it's a, and it's a carnivore. The, um, the, the caterpillar actually feeds on these, these uh, scale insects, and it's also fed by the ants by Tropolaxis as well. Uh, Tropolaxis is like, like a cuckoo being fed by, a, by, 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 its, by its, uh, its adoptive mother. Also scale insects, Berlichila uh, uh, aslanga, one of the buffs, feeding on waxy scale insects. And of course here is a Pentilla tropicalis, and this plant here, Albizia ergampifolia, has got extra floral nectaries on where the, where the leaf petioles come from, from the stalk. And this butterfly here is actually feeding on, a, on an extra floral nectary. Some other examples of nectaring. Again, this is a Benonia. When they get going up in Zululand or in fact anywhere in, in, the, in the tropics and subtropics, it can be a fantastic sight with thousands of butterflies flying around them. Aronia cleodora, which is all a common African butterfly on the Anotis. Again, big butterfly, large flowers, uh, Halpoestes with the, with the, with the Mocha Swallowtail, Pileodardanus, again, which is found all over tropical and subtropical Africa. Um, and then here we have little, our little uh, um, ciliate blues, the Anthenes. Um, small butterflies, again, tending to go for these flowers with the, uh, with, with the short flowers. Here's Tetrastolega natalensis, which is very similar plants found all over the grassland areas of Africa. Always worth looking on because having again short flowers, the butterflies love them. Put this one in here because it's one of the places not, uh, that Farney was talking about is the macroland. Uh, you don't only have to go into the forested areas. Semi deserts often very, very good for butterflies, particularly if there's been good rains in winter and in spring, the whole place lights up. Like it, all over the world, you get this sort of thing going on. The Atacama Desert in Chile, the Sonora Desert in North America. And I'm sure also further north in Africa, where after rains, the butterflies come out, come out of their, their, wherever they were hiding as, as larvae or eggs or pupae, and you find them on the flowers. Other foods, not just, not just nectar, um, tree sap uh, is very popular, particularly with the Caraxes and, the, um, and, and, and some of the browns. And this one here, you can see here, there's two species of Caraxes feeding on a wounded tree, which is leaking sap. Here also a bit further down, two more Caraxes. You can see some beetles here as well. And normally what happens is the beetle, the beetle has actually laid eggs on the, on, the, on the tree and there are larvae boring into the trunk. And the, the tree of course leaks sap, the sap ferments along come the butterflies. Sometimes not so much nice things. The Caraxes in particular love, love uh, dog droppings and any form of carnivore dropping, elephant dung, Wherever you find a, a piece of poo lying on the floor, it's often good to look for butterflies. Um, there's a, uh, where, where people grow sugar cane and people chew it up and, throw, and then spit it out. The butterflies come along and, uh, and, and, and drink the, uh, the juices from the sugar cane. You can actually cheat and put an orange bag up, uh, an onion bag full of, uh, of fruit, which has been allowed to start to go off. And the butterflies will come along and uh, not a very natural looking background, but it's a great way of attracting butterflies. Um, and of course figs as well, uh, either on the tree or below the tree. Uh, I remember in the Ivory Coast, I unfortunately didn't take any photographs, uh, 
I was taught by, um, by Torben Larsen and by, uh, by Hayden Warringash that you watch out for, you watch out for, um, for hornbills flying through the air in the forest and you look where they're flying to. When you see what tree they're going in, you go to the bottom of that tree and all the fruit on the floor, all of a sudden the ground just takes off and there are thousands of butterflies. Great place to find them. Uh, and, and a really weird one, there's a, a couple of butterfly species which love to feed on something in a grass fly. Now the, the grass experts tell me that grass flies do not produce nectar, but, but plain tigers, Dallas chrysippus, and these Biblia elithia, you often find them sucking something from a grass fly. There's a PhD waiting for somebody there. Larval food, obviously in a short presentation like this, I can't go through all the different uh, uh, things that the caterpillars do. Again, just some examples of, of where you can find caterpillars and what to look for. And in fact, Lepsock has got a, 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 um, a project going called the Caterpillar Rearing Group. And in a short period of time, these people have gone from, I think we used to know something like 1% of our life histories of African Lepidoptera has gone up to something like 10% now, just through, just through their, their actions. Skippers is, is Ciliardis kayfly, very brightly colored caterpillar, which is probably a mimic of the, of the Danas Christopher caterpillar, but it lives in this little Cornish pasty type arrangement but it makes some its host plant and it hides in there and comes out to feed. Some, a lot of caterpillars are, 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 are gregarious. Sometimes you find more than one instar together on the same leaf. Caraxes, the trick is to look for these silken pads. Particularly when it's been raining or it's misty, you'll see these, these pads, leap, they, they light up like spider's webs in the wet. Little, little droplets of water sit on them. And if you look for those, you'll often find the caterpillar sitting them and you can go and read it through. This is a, a Vanessa Cardui, the painted lady, a uh, very, very common butterfly, but the caterpillars are difficult to find because they're nocturnal. And they live at the base of the plant and come to feed at night. Danus chrysippus, very easy to find. Gumphocarpus and other members of the uh, upper side ACI grow, sorry, a sleeping ACI fly, flower all over Africa. The caterpillars are quite easy to find. The ones that are not so easy to find are the ones, these Lycenids are the weird life histories. Like this is a pentaline. You can see the caterpillar extremely hairy. You know, butterfly caterpillars are not, are not normally known as being, uh, as being hairy, um, hairy insects. But this one here is feeding on the lichen on a rock. You can see it's grazed the lichen off. And here's a couple of examples of tropolaxis, which is, which is mouth to mouth feeding. Here's a woolly legs being fed by an ant, an ant. It's the first time it's ever been recorded. I need to write that up for metamorphosis. And this is an incredibly rare butterfly from the Cape. I didn't take that photograph, Alan Heath did, and it's being fed. This is Chrysalis dictoni, the, uh, the Stranfeld copper, and there's an ant feeding it there as well. Lookalikes, just some examples of what, uh, of what Oscar was showing you earlier. Um, these are called mimicurines. You get, you get groups of, of Malarian and Batesian mimics, which, which you get many species of butterfly with the same basic pattern, like the Danas chrysippus, this particular example of a Papiliodardinus female, Similar black, white, and orange, Acrea acara, and it's and one of its mimics, the uh, Pseudocrea boys, the body trimini. Um, we've seen this one earlier, Naavius with, uh, with Walbergi, uh, Acrea agonisi with another Pseudocrea, which is the Eurytus, very similar, uh, and Amoris acheria, which have got three different mimics here on the same page. So there's the, there's the model, and there is a Pseudocrea, which looks like it, a Hyperlimnus, which looks like it and another form of Papiliodardinus, the uh, form Cinea. That is the same butterfly as that. And you saw the male earlier on. It's a big yellowish cream butterfly oh, with, uh, with, with black, uh, yeah. black borders. Um, and um, yeah, um, they, they, uh, the females, there are many, many different forms around Africa. Finally, moving on to what I call not butterflies because they look like them, but they're not. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of day flying butterfly, uh, moth species. For instance, hawk moths are often found flying during the day. Some species are, are you find them at, at night or daytime and they're, they're always after the nectar. This is one of the better known ones, the African hummingbird hawk moth, uh, which is hovering in front of these, uh, these flowers. Um, Calliarchus abraxus, these, uh, these are geometrids, uh, inchworms. And the caterpillars feed on, on, uh, on cycads, and uh, cycads are full of zamiacin, which is a toxin. So here you've got a, a butterfly, which, or a moth, sorry, which is, uh, which, which is showing that it's distasteful. The same thing goes for this white bear moth. 
This one's a bit of a mystery because it's, it's called a peach moth because the, because the caterpillars will eat peaches. And I know that people overseas actually rear them through on peaches, but the favorite host plant down here is Dianbolia. And as far as I know, Dianbolia doesn't have any toxins. Peach does. Peach, of course, has got, uh, has, has got um, uh, cyanide in the leaves. Um, Euchroma amarina, pleasant hornet, another day flying moth. Very, you can see here, you've got wasp mimicry. You've got this black and yellow and red uh, colouring. You can see these are actually feeding on dead flowers or, or, or wilted flowers of Senecio. This is another instance of what's called pharmacophagy. They're taking in the uh, alkaloids from, the, from this plant, which, are, which they use to develop their own defences. Um, these burnet moths, the fire grid burnets, again, brightly coloured day flying moth. Eutithesa pulchella, very common all over Africa. These little Amata cooleniae, which are in the Arctini, very brightly, they're not particularly brightly coloured. When the sun hits them, they light up blue because they're iridescent. The, uh, the emperor moths also have got some day flying members, the uh, Pseudophilia pollinaris. It's called the false Apollo. You don't get Apollo butterflies in Africa, uh, but this moth actually looks, a, with a bit of imagination, looks a bit like one. And uh, then, of course, a lot of the tiger moths are day flying as well. The, uh, the, the festive red tiger and the beautiful tiger. Again, these, these are highly distasteful creatures. This one in particular, I can vouch for. I once caught one and then made the mistake of touching my face afterwards. And I came up in blisters. And then, of course, you get these little satin moths which, which live deep in the forests. And they, they look like a little ethereal white piece of, uh, of, of a, a seed of a... Of a, of a, of a, of a of a tree floating around in, in the air. Very, 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 very delicate creatures, also diurnal. And this is just a few examples of the many, many thousands of, uh, of day flying moths. So it's important to photograph them because the Lepi map is not just about butterflies, it's about all Lepidoptera. Some resources, I'm not going to click on any of these links there, they'll be in the, uh, the presentation which is going to go live on, the, on, on, on YouTube. Uh, Metamorphosis, which is the Journal of Lepidoptera Society of Africa, is available on the uh, on the internet and that has got some huge resources for um, there's an encyclopedia on there which is really a, an online version of Bob Carcasson's uh, uh, catalog which Mark Williams and the Lepsop people have kept on. The Caterpillar Rearing Group, people who want to breed things, Lepi Map, Mark Farney's spoken about that. Um, I produced this butterfly app uh, which was which is, which is based on South African butterflies, um, works very similar to Oscar's app, but it's, it's, uh, it contains all 806 um, um, sea species and subspecies you find down here. And of course, the new book that's just, that just came out uh, Christmas time. Uh, these are the resources you can get down here. Obviously, Oscar's spoken about some of the ones you can get further north. Um, Torben wrote a book on, on, on Kenyan butterflies as well, and also on Botswana butterflies. So there are books available. Unfortunately, a lot of them are out of print. Um, but if you get into the Metamorphosis uh, Africa, Afrotropical um, um, Encyclopedia, there's a lot of information in there. Not so many photographs, but a lot of information about the house plants and where you find them. And that is that. I managed to get through it in, uh, in, um, in 20 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Many thanks, Steve. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we've, we've had Fantastic presentations this evening. Um, there have been some comments in the chat box of people who are just starting out with, um, you know, with their uh, with their interest in Lepidoptera, and I think it uh, you've you've been spoilt uh, by this evening's presentations, and um, by you know by some of the best known uh, you know people in the Lepidopterist field that uh, that we have locally. So thanks very very much. Um, Liz, I'd just like to, I know we're way over our, our time. I'm just concerned that we'll be cut off. I'm not sure if that'll happen. Perhaps Itasa can, can tell us. But otherwise, do we have time for a couple of questions, perhaps? Yeah, we have like 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I don't know if you've been going through to see whether there are any specific questions in the, uh, in the chat group, perhaps. Um, yeah. the or if anybody would like to raise a hand and, and, and ask any questions of, uh, of any of the speakers. I saw some questions, but I think they were answered through the, through the questions. Okay. Yeah. I saw they are. There were some questions. I think Veronique asked how, you know, being new to 
Lepidoptera how to upload photos to LepiMap. And Megan, thanks very much for posting the link to your slideshow. Um, that very easy, those very easy steps to do that. Anyone? I think, yeah, a lot of people are. Oh, yeah. uh, complimenting the, the speakers. The question about integrating databases is, is uh, that's one that is actually coming to the fore now, how, how we go about doing that. So that's something that I think we're going to be discussing that at the Leptoc AGM on, the, on, on, on Sunday, because there are lots of different databases um, and uh, the challenge is how to uh, integrate them together. Okay. Les, there's a question for you from Kate. And as well, QDSs. Yeah. Yeah. Not not at the moment, but um, but now that I'm Renee's boss, I can actually <laughs> <laughs> ask him to do these things. Renee's got a lot of things on his. Um, on his slate that he wants to uh, that he wants to tackle, so uh, it's going to we will get round to all these things, but it's going to take uh, take take a while. So um, one thing that's going to go up or of of maps for, uh, for all sorts of different country species maps. Um, we have one map for every every country in Africa prepared, but many countries there are maps, and I think many of those are up on the website already. Now there's a question there from Deanne about that exact thing in fact. Are any considering to expand to other countries with Letty Map? And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, oh yes, yeah. Yeah. So so um, the, the, the 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 real the real thing that we have to get right is actually um, um, servicing those other countries in Africa in the same way as as um, as, as Farney has demonstrated to us that we can do uh, the, the southern end of the continent. So we'd like to, um, to, 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 to expand all those sorts of things to uh, other parts of Africa as well, the ones that are really uh, greatly used. We want to do that. Oh, there is a question in Facebook. Uh, someone says, mm, um, what's the best time for butterflies in South Africa? Ah, Steve, nothing. would you like to answer that? Um, it's like like the rest the rest of the of the world. Basically, there are two peaks. One of them is in our spring, which is, starts around about now, um, and and goes through into early summer, sort of uh, late October, early November. Then there's there's usually a gap in midsummer, um, in, in in the northern hemisphere they call it the June gap, and you don't really see that much. And then a really strong emergence in in late summer and early autumn, um, from normally from around about the end of February right through into, into May or even June. And uh, you get different species at different times, at different times of the year as well. That's the other interesting thing. And of course, in the, in the, high, mount, the high mountainous areas, you tend to get them in midsummer, in, in, in December, January, because that's the only time of the year when it's warm enough for them to fly. So if you're going to go butterflying in places like the Drakensberg or the, the High Cape Mountains, then you need to go there in, um, in, in, in um, midsummer. If you're aiming to go from a more uh, tropical part of Africa perspective. It varies a bit, of course, but in, in rainforest, it's less sensitive. Yeah. But generally, when you're in drier areas, you the best time of the year tends to be when it's shift of seasons. So when the rains are just starting or finishing, and the worst part of the year is the very end of the dry season, which can be more or less depleted. Mm. That's the same. In fact, my, my best experiences in tropical rainforests have always been um, either, you know, at the end of the rains around about, around about May, um, um, what they call the second rains or the first rains in Kenya um, around about uh, uh, November, around about that sort of time. It's always been the best, the best place. That I've, been to, I've been to Kakamega in June and saw so hardly any. My, my experience of rainforest is that it's also highly unpredictable. They're so weird population dynamics and they're often joined with parasites that we don't really understand. You can go at a time where it should be so good you can't believe it, you get there and you don't see anything. And you come back a week later and things are steaming. So 
my general advice is if you go to the rainforest and you don't see anything, just take a break or do something else or go to another forest and come back later because it is, it's very frustrating sometimes if you don't live nearby and you're looking forward to the time of your life and you see nothing. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asking a question here, what's the longest butterfly migration in Africa? Uh, um, the longest one is longer than Africa. The longest migration is the Painted Lady. The Painted Ladies who reach West Africa, they will go all the way to Northern Europe every year and back over several generations. But it was shown quite recent, we weren't really sure how they were connected, but it's shown now that Painted Ladies frequently every year across the Sahara, just like migratory birds, but they do it over maybe five, six generations a year, which is quite astonishing. And that butterfly itself is the most widespread in the world, it exists everywhere except the Antarctic region and our high Arctic and South America. Otherwise you find the same species all over the world. <laughs> 